This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovator's Garage, where you learn to create your next game-changing killer innovation. Welcome to Killer Innovations. I'm your host, Phil McKinney. We are back here in the studio. I'm actually getting ready to head out on, on some travel in the mobile studio to interview innovators who are doing interesting innovations in non-obvious industries and non-obvious locations. Um, I'm actually getting inundated with uh, emails from municipalities, governors, all wanting uh, us to bring the studio to their locale and highlight innovators in their community. If you've got somebody who you think would be a great uh, guest on the show, just drop me a note over at phil at killerinnovations.com and we'll see what we can do. It is limited the fact that I have to be able to bring the studio with me. So it's something that we need to um, drive from the standpoint of uh, uh, getting the, the, the whole travel schedule worked out. Um, this fall, we'll be primarily spending uh, our time east of the Mississippi. And then right after the first of the year, we'll be spending some time uh, west of the Mississippi. So that's how to think about scheduling. It's a unique scheduling challenge when you... Uh, physically bring your studio with you. So uh, with that, today we're going to have a discussion on a topic on something that is quite familiar to, to you, the regular listeners of the show. You know we've talked a lot about frameworks. In the case of the framework I have a, have a big supporter of is FIRE, F-I-R-E, Focus, Ideation, Ranking, and Execution. Every innovation process has to have those four elements. The tools and approaches and strategies to address each of those is just as uh, important. So whether it is um, if you in ideation believe in straight brainstorming or trend safaris or however you capture your ideas is great. Today, we're going to talk to a guest who's got an approach that they call smart ideation and understand their thought on ideation, ideation for creating business ideas that uh, can lead to ultimate success. So um, today's guest is Patrick Henry. He's the CEO for Quest Fusion. Uh, Patrick has a lot of history, um, having been CEO at companies like Entropic um, and others, uh, has been quite successful in his career. But uh, this is a, an area that, for Patrick, I didn't quite uh, understand or appreciate his background and how it fit into this. But Patrick has now joined the club of innovation geeks talking about how do you actually generate those ideas. Uh, Patrick, thanks for taking the time and joining us on the show today. Uh, thank you so much, Phil. So, Patrick, give, give the listener a little bit of background about yourself. Um, how did you end up where you, today uh, you're, uh, you're doing your work at Quest Fusion? What was it you were doing before? And give us a little context. Yeah, thanks, Phil. I was, I was a technology executive and CEO of startup company, Serial Entrepreneur, for for over 20 years and as you know we sold Entropic at the end of 2014 beginning of 2015 and decided to leverage kind of all my knowledge and experience from doing this for so long uh, with other startups uh, really trying to provide strategic guidance to them and as part of that process I uh, found a common set of issues that they had including doing ideation in a smart way and wrote a book called Plan, Commit, Win, 90 Days to Creating a Fundable Startup and at the foundation of any great business, of course, is a, is a good business idea. So we came up with a framework of allowing entrepreneurs, startup CEOs, co-founders to kind of think through their business idea in a relatively rapid fashion and um, see if it makes sense or not from a business perspective. So, yeah, I mean, part of the challenge is obviously with any part of the innovation process is, is the idea generation and how do you qualify the idea as we've talked about many times on the show here you know coming up with ideas isn't all that hard coming up with really great ideas is a lot harder than it sounds and then how do you rank those ideas to know which one you work on first which one you work on second and which one you work on third so your idea about ideation is it broadly apl applicable to ideation or is it more specifically for identifying um, relatively new business opportunities for entrepreneurs? Well, I think that, that the foundation of smart ideation is you're trying to build a company that can be 
massive, you know, basically addressing a large and rapidly growing market, and that you have a unique solution that you can sustain over a longer period of time. Uh, so if you're doing something that's, I guess, purely altruistic, that doesn't need to have a strong business model behind it, then my framework probably isn't as applicable. But if you're actually trying to build a growth company, which are most of my clients are trying to do, they want to raise outside capital, they want to be the next big technology startup uh, and the next great startup success story, then uh, this framework has a lot of applicability. Perfect. What's but There are some other processes that are out there, right? I mean, you know, there's literally books written about um, the ideation. What What's the biggest failing you've seen when you work with your clients um, around what they did in the past? You know, what kind of approaches that other people tried that just haven't panned out quite as well? Well, most of the people that I interact with, clients, and, you know, I do a lot of pro bono work, too, with, with earlier stage startups through Evo Nexus, which is a technology incubator, through Chairman's Roundtable, which focuses on smaller businesses that aren't necessarily growth companies, uh, is that there's typically a founder or a couple co-founders that, that come up with an idea based on their experience or a variety of other different things that that could be the um, the genesis of the idea, if you will, and we can talk about some of those if you'd like, but they haven't gone through the thorough process of, does this really make sense for customers? And is there a big enough group of customers to make this into a big business? And how do you go about iterating things uh, and basically the fundamentals of making it into a successful business? So there's kind of like you said, the idea technology geek compared to somebody that is really focused on the business model and how do I make money out of this, this particular idea? And it typically requires some level of refinement in order to get to that level. Yeah, I mean, for instance, you know, I, you know, I get contacted by a lot of entrepreneurs and one of the common things I hear is, is you know, I've started this business because it's a problem I had and therefore if I have it, there there must be a lot of other people that have the same problem. And they, they make that assumption that they are representative of the customer without actually doing the legwork to say, is this really a problem or not? Is that something common you see with your clients? I think it's incredibly common. And in fact, there's some kind of funny stories when we were running in Tropic, you know, we developed a, a technology called Mocha, which enabled multi-room DVR. And especially as we were dealing with prospective investors and <clears throat> even as we you know, took the company public and we were dealing with, with Wall Street investors, they would, because it was about watching TV, they all had their personal experience with watching TV. And it's like, well, I, I only watch maybe one hour of TV a day or I don't have a TV or I only have a TV in one room in the house. And that really has nothing to do <laughs> with the overall market opportunity. The overall market opportunity is there's, an average of three and a half TVs per home in the U.S. The average U.S. person watches TV for eight hours a day. Uh, DVR at that time had already penetrated homes by about 30%. There was already a good understanding of DVR, and you know people wanted that functionality at every TV in the house, or at least you know the, the, the couple main TVs that they used. So it's it's interesting that a lot of times, if it's especially if it's a consumer-facing product, but even sometimes in B2B that people kind of leverage their experience and don't think through the broader implications for a real market opportunity and a real set of customers that, that might be able to drive a big business. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it, I always had this problem when I was CTO at HP, right? The engineers would design a product and uh, I would, you know, to make a point, I would state that they've designed a product for a total market of 47,000. <laughs> that's the total number of engineers at HP because they're the only ones who would ever figure out how to use this product uh, in, in any shape, way, or form, right? And yeah. uh, it, it is hard, though. We, have to, we all have to get out of that realm. You know, we may think the idea is great, and it could be great, but the question is then is how do you validate it? How do you, un how do you really define that the problem is what you think the problem is and that you, you potentially have um, the solution? So in the case of problem definition, um, how hard do you think it is for consumers to uh, think about uh, the problem space? We've only got a few quick seconds here before we have to go to break. Yeah, 
like part there's a five step process in smart ideation and, and you're kind of getting to the part of you know customer problem solution test which is the first test and i like to answer three questions is it a big and important problem for the customer number two is the customer desperate to solve the problem and number three is my idea vastly superior to alternatives perfect we're going to leave it right there we're going to take a quick commercial break and we're going to pick up our conversation with with patrick henry talking about uh his concepts behind smart ideation and we're going to hop right in to the uh, the five things five items that he just mentioned so don't go anywhere we'll be right back after this quick commercial break you're listening to killer innovations on the biz talk radio network Welcome back to Kill Innovations. We are picking up our conversation with Patrick Henry, CEO for Quest Fusion, talking about his his approach to smart ideation. Now, Patrick, as we were going to commercial break, you started talking about the five-step process to smart ideation. Let's pick up where we left off, and you were talking specifically about the customer problem solution test. So let's pick it up there. Okay. Well, let me give you kind of the highlight of the, the five steps. Um, Number one is what we call the customer problem solution test. Number two, sustainable competitive advantage test. Number three, the intersection test. Number four, the market size and growth test. And then number five, the idea refinement test. And really with number five, I think that's really an ongoing process where you're constantly interacting with customers and uh, refining your ideas Maybe even if you don't include a new set of features on the current product, you ultimately, as you want to have a customer roadmap that uh, allows you to continue to evolve the product over time. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so you were talking then about the uh, specifically the customer problem solution test as we went into the, uh, the break. Why is it so important on the problem solution test? Why is that the first one? I think that in my interactions with, I mean, hundreds of engineers over building dozens of businesses, as well as dozens of of entrepreneurs trying to build companies over the last few years, there's always this product focus around the discussion. Um, And a big part of the problem that I've had or that these entrepreneurs have had with their companies is how do I raise outside capital? You know, I really have this great idea. I want to grow the business, but it's going to require some outside funding in order to grow it. So I have just a a quick conversation with them. And what's usually apparent in most of these interactions is that they want to talk about 90% of the time about the product and maybe 10% of the time about the business. Mm -hmm. And you really need to be spending more like 20% of your time talking about the product and 80% about the business opportunity, which really is very customer centric. You know, what problem are you solving? And are you, do you have a full understanding of what that problem is from the customer's perspective, not from your perspective? Yeah, good point. I mean, part of the problem is, is one, being able to even quantify or identify the problem. And then the second is, is can you even, can you test for it? You may think it's a problem, but is it a real problem in the minds of the customer? Number two, you talk about the competitive advantage test. What is it you're trying to discern there? So let's say you actually do have a solution for an important customer problem where they're losing sleep over it. And you have something that has significant value versus alternative solutions. And those alternatives may be, direct competitive products, or they could be, you know, just other ways of solving the problem, what we would call substitute products. The next question is, if you're trying to build the business, how do you sustain that over time? You know, what kind of, do you have an innovation roadmap over the next five to 10 years that provides a roadmap of providing new features, new functions, new capabilities, um, allows your core technology to penetrate into adjacent product market segments? And can you build those what we call layers of competitive advantage that allow you to sustain a business over a longer period of time? You don't want to be a one-trick pony or a one-and-done type of company. Yeah, exactly. I mean, part of it is, I mean, in the, in the 
material that you sent me ahead of time. What I really picked up on, though, is is there's a lot of subtleties in the, the competitive advantage, such as, you know, switching costs and IP and um, service and quality. It's all the elements that, like you said though earlier, you know, people only, only spend 5 or 10% thinking about the business where they need to be spending inherently more about the business and not so round up specifically on uh, the feature functions list that people typically want to spend a lot of time talking about. Yeah, and it's it's very interesting because the a lot of people don't even get past the product features, but let's say you're a marketing person and you get to a product features benefits analysis. Even getting to that point is insufficient because that's really a snapshot. And what we're really talking about here is a motion picture and more of a value-based proposition as opposed to just a benefit and just a benefit that might exist in a particular product cycle not over a sustained period of time. The uh, the next one, number three, was is the intersection test, which is a test that I haven't actually, I mean, I've heard about people do problem solution testing and they look at competitive advantage. But this intersection test is actually um, interesting. Talk a little bit more about that. Well, it, get, it gets to how are you as a person and how are you and your team able to sustain going through all the ridiculousness of building a company over a sustained period of time? And what I like to talk about, and, and, and Steve Jobs and other successful entrepreneurs have talked about this a lot, you know, you want to have an intersection of your passion, your domain expertise, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute, a big customer problem, and then being able to form a team of passionate people around that who can execute, getting back to your FIRE framework. You know, you can have focus, you can have ideation, but if you can't execute, uh, especially in a technology business, you're not going to win. Right. Exactly. So, so, but what I mean by domain expertise is you need to have specialized product knowledge and specialized market knowledge to be able to understand how the target customers think. And you typically have to bring some of that to the table yourself, but also surround yourself with advisors that have some of that intimate knowledge that you may not have. Yeah, I mean, the uh, the domain expertise becomes interesting. And there's and actually, it's, there's a number of entrepreneurs out there who actually focus on really you can go after and solve any problem. You don't need to have passion. Um, you don't even have to have the expertise to go after those areas. But I would, you and I are more on the same cloth. I find it um, hard to believe that you're going to be committed for the long run if you don't have passion um, for the, the program or for the effort that is uh, out there. Otherwise, um, you're just going to burn yourself out if you don't have that inherent internal passion um, and interest around any given topic area. It's hard to sustain any kind of pace and endurance um, without it. So we're going to take another quick commercial break. When we come back, we're going to pick up our conversation um, with Patrick Henry. We've covered three of the five steps in his smart ideation, including customer problem solution test, the competitive advantage test, and the intersection test. We have two more to go through, so don't go anywhere. You're not going to want to miss this as uh, we continue the conversation with Patrick Henry, CEO for Quest Fusion. You're listening to Kill Innovations on the BizTalk Radio Network. Welcome back to the show. We're continuing our conversation with Patrick Henry, CEO for Quest Fusion. Now, Patrick, we covered three of the five. Uh, elements of your smart ideation. Let's talk about the next two. Number four was market size and growth test. Talk about that. Yeah, so the, the companies that I'm working with in general, they break into two types. Um, the first type are businesses that typically end up being small to mid-side businesses. Maybe they're doing five to $10 million in revenue. They throw off some cash for the founder and they build kind of a nice little business that can be you know, a great wealth creating business. The second type are what you traditionally think of being funded by venture capital. So the market size and growth test really is operative around that. Um, 
it's interesting. I did a lot of background research around startup success and failure and what causes those things to happen in, in the book, Plan, Commit, Win. And one of the things that was also interesting that I found out in the research was that only about 2,500 companies out of roughly half a million new employer-based firms founded each year reach $100 million in annual revenue. That's only four one-hundredths of a percent of companies. And the big factor that determines if you get into that club is the underlying growth opportunity in your target market. Um, and there's been a lot of research around that. And if you are not one of these kind of super grower companies, it's very unlikely that you're going to get to that huge valuation, which is what uh, VCs are looking to invest in. Yeah, exactly. We talked, there was a show we did recently, we talked about the, the challenge of getting a show, I mean, getting a, an idea big enough. I mean, at HP, I'd have entrepreneurs come in and they're pitching an idea that's like worth a hundred million or two hundred million, and I'm like, eh, "You're missing a digit." <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. For and HP, it's, if it's not a billion dollar idea, that just doesn't have the means to take advantage of it. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because you know you you need to be focused enough and and initially penetrate a defensible niche that then has your ability to penetrate adjacent market opportunities. I mean, you look at Amazon, they were big in books before they did anything else. You look at Facebook, you know, initially they were just for Harvard, then they were just for emails with a .edu, just universities, and then eventually expanded out from there. So you have to have that kind of bigger long-term vision, bigger market, but then you also have to establish that initial success in some type of protected niche that can grow and, and then you can, you know, basically what I like to call island hop. Great. Now, the number five is your ideal refinement test. And this is, uh, you know, really the, the, the iteration, I guess, portion of your process, right? Which is, it's the constant, you know, learning, constant feedback loop that you're looking for, correct? Correct. Yeah, so it's really refining your idea through intimate customer engagement and a secondary way to kind of get this refinement is through having an advisory board, both a technical and business advisory board that are, are inside experts, industry experts. Uh, they can provide that essential non-biased feedback and even play devil's advocate and kind of beat up your ideas to see if they make sense. Another concept I like to implement in building businesses is the idea of finding teaching customers that are willing to work with you early on and provide you that feedback in exchange for something. There's usually some type of quid pro quo. Maybe you give them early access to technology for their feedback, or maybe you give them some time-based feature exclusivity, but uh, that, that feedback can be invaluable. Yeah, so I mean, when I look across all of these five uh, tests that are part of your smart ideation, I'm assuming that given all the customers big and small that you've worked with, there has to be some common set of qualities around this set of uh, business ideators, right? You know, what, what, are the, what are the common qualities, elements, uh, characteristics have you seen for those that have been really successful um, ideators of new business ideas? Well, a lot of it deals with, you know, being creative. And, and sometimes people think of the creative process as, oh, give me a lot of flexibility to take as much time as I want and think as much as I want. And uh, it, it really doesn't work that way. The, the best ideators that I've ever worked with, and there's a number of them, the biggest thing that makes them different is they look at the world from a very curious standpoint. You know, they're, they're always trying to figure things out. They're tinkerers. They, they're typically early adopters and gadget users. And, you know, they're coming up with new ways of, of doing existing things and then having, you know, creative discussions and debates with other people that are also interested in those kinds of things. Now, not all those ideas will be great business ideas. That's why you need a screening process, as you mentioned, in the fire process. And that, that screening process becomes very important. But an ideator is typically very disciplined. Um, even in the creative arts, you know, most of the really genius level people that were very creative 
they were very disciplined, whether they were authors or musicians or, you know, they, they, they worked super hard. They had that passion to create new ideas all the time. Yeah, it, it is interesting, right? Because in the case of the VCs in Silicon Valley, they find an entrepreneur who's had one success and they're willing to back them because they are those constant generator of new ideas. It's, it's like a never ending flow of ideas. The question for them is which one are they passionate about? And the uh, VCs have figured out that can they take advantage of that and uh, and just use it as a vacuum cleaner process to get as many ideas uh, into the hopper as possible. And then on the flip side of that, if you look at kind of the, the research around startup and business success and failure, partnering those people with somebody that really understands the business side and provides the business discipline and understanding the business models is where the most successful companies come from. So as we uh, get ready to head out at the end of this segment, so Patrick, Quest Fusion is what? What's your business? What you you are a San Diego-based consulting company, but who are your, who are your target customers? Who who do you serve? Yeah, so from the beginning, which has been we're three years into it, was to build an online platform for providing tools uh, to startup CEOs, company founders. Uh, and especially companies that are trying to raise outside growth capital from venture capitalists. So built in, in the effort of building an online platform, we now have Plan, Commit, Win, Mastery, which is the book Come to Life. Uh, we have Quest Fusion, Plan, Commit, Win, Membership, which is a supportive peer group. And then I do do some face-to-face -face advisory group uh, business as well. But so the huge focus is really on the online business. So, so Patrick, if people want to find out more about you and Quest Fusion, where's the best place they can find that information? Yeah, you can go to questfusion.com. That's probably the best place. I'm also very active on social media. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Quest Fusion and on Facebook, same at Quest Fusion and Instagram at Plan Commit Win. Perfect. Hey, Patrick, I do want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule today. This fits exactly into the conversation we have on this show a lot, which is there's never one perfect tool or one perfect way to go about generating an idea, validating that idea, and then executing that idea. And uh, you are uh, the, the, the perfect example of that, of being a tool aimed at a specific uh, challenge in, in the ideation process for those that are trying to Take and generate an idea to build out a business that's going to scale at a significant rate at a significant pace um, to have strong, uh, meaningful impact. So congratulations on uh, what I think is a, is a very interesting and great process. And I would encourage listeners to hop on over to Quest Fusion and check that out. Um, again, you can go to questfusion.com. We'll have all the links in the show notes. So you have... Uh, uh, nowhere uh, to uh, to avoid this. I'm going to make it easy for you to to find Patrick and and find his information. And Patrick, you've given me a document here, which I think is a great summary. Is that something we could make available to the listeners? Yeah. The um, if you go to smartideation.com, that's just a simple landing page where you can download, you know, my guide to smart ideation. Perfect. So we'll also include a link on that so you can get this document. And with that, we're going to wrap up this segment. Don't go anywhere. The four segments coming up. It'll be another five minutes to new ideas, a new format for this segment of the show um, that give you a five-minute quick jolt, some challenging questions to help you come up with some great ideas. Don't mess out. So don't go anywhere. Stay right there. We'll be right back after this quick commercial break. Back in the early days of this show, I would share what I called a killer question in each episode. These questions were designed to be used in your personal team or organization innovation efforts. Now, based on feedback from listeners like you, we've decided to bring it back with some improvements. Each episode of the Killer Innovations has a segment that I'm now calling Five Minutes to New Ideas. They are designed for the creative mind looking for that next great idea. Each episode will challenge you to think differently about your business, your products, your services, and yourself by asking unique, funny, and sometimes crazy questions. These questions are designed to force you to look beyond the obvious and to uncover those ideas and opportunities 
you never before considered. So, get out your notebook and be ready to uncover that game-changing idea. Here is 5 Minutes to New Ideas. A few years ago, a passenger complaint letter to Virgin Atlantic circulated around the web. It was very long, fully illustrated with photos, and clearly somewhat tongue-in-cheek, and very funny. But it made a few good points about the bad food and bad service this particular passenger had experienced on a recent flight. Almost three years later, it still occasionally shows up as one of the most read stories at telegraph.co.uk. In 2009, another disgruntled passenger created a music video about how United Baggage Handlers had broken his $3,500 guitar. He uploaded the song to YouTube and to date has been viewed tens of millions of times. United's customer service department, which had originally denied him any kind of compensation, quickly changed their minds as the video went viral. They adjusted their tone from defensive to humorous and held a meeting with the passenger. Eventually, the airline made a charitable donation to a jazz school in his name. The problem is that none of their existing former or potential customers care that United eventually resolved the customer complaint. All they remember is that it took a funny song and 9 million YouTube hits before the airline would do the right thing. United responded about as nimbly and elegantly as a dad trying to decode what their kids' friends are saying at their kid's birthday party. Not pretty. The point is, it's easier than ever to find out what your customers are thinking and saying about you these days. It's also much easier for their opinions to go viral. So it's imperative that you respond to your customer with the same speed and immediacy they use to critique you. Social networking sites have fundamentally changed the nature of the customer complaint. Customer complaints are morphing from one-off exchanges between a customer and a service representative into an ongoing conversation, often in real time, visible to the public, and open to anyone who cares to comment. By monitoring these sites, you can hear what your customers are saying about you without them even being aware that your opinions are being heard. Back when I was CTO at HP, I found out about a notebook hinge problem through Twitter. How? I have Hootsuite app up all the time, and I use it to search for any tweet related to products or services that I'm interested in. One day, I was sitting in my office, and a customer tweeted he was having a problem with a hinge on his HP notebook. Complaint got my attention. I put down what I was doing and went to respond to the tweet, but before I could even get my hands on the keyboard, another customer replied. The customer said, quote, it's a known problem and HP has a repair protocol. A few seconds later, he used a second tweet to direct the customer to the customer service number. What? I was a CTO and even I had no idea that we A, had a problem or B, had a solution. Yet here was a customer who was at least two steps ahead of me. I grabbed the phone, dialed the product team, and asked, what's this I'm hearing about a problem with the hinges on one of our notebooks? The person on the other end nearly had a heart attack. His department was carefully preparing the internal email describing the problem, and suddenly the CTO is breathing down his neck asking him what the heck is going on. The reality is you can no longer keep problems like this off the radar, either within your organization or with your customers. The only option is to engage with the people who care enough to make their feelings public. And don't stop at simply resolving an issue. The customers who take time out to post their opinions or direct other to solutions are the ones who have actually thought about what you do and how you do it. Odds are, if they've complained about what you're doing, they've also thought about ways to do it better. So ask yourself, any others on your team, who complains about my product? Ask. And do not blow them off. Dig deeper to understand why they took the time to raise the issue with you. You may be surprised where the complaint breadcrumbs may lead you. I'm Phil McKinney, and thanks for listening.
Thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join in. If you have any comments or suggestions, drop me a note at phil at killerinnovations.com. Beyond this show, I write about my personal experiences of being in the innovation game for the last two decades. Topics include innovation, creativity, culture, team building, metrics, frustrations, leadership, and how to win. You can find that content over at philmckinney.com. You can also find out information about my book, Beyond the Obvious, including extensive excerpts over at beyondtheobvious.com. You can find hardcover, digital, and audio versions of my book on Amazon or wherever you get your books from. Now, the reason I started this show back in 2005 was to pay back my early mentor. My first mentor, Bob Davis, invested an immense amount of time in training and coaching me, which had a major impact on my career. When I went back and asked him how I could pay him back, he laughed and said I couldn't. I had to pay it forward. If I could ask for a favor, could you help me pay it forward? How? One, by giving us a rating wherever you get your podcast, as that helps spread the word. And two, by telling others about the show. If you want to be part of the conversation between the shows, I hang out in the Innovators community on Slack. The Innovators community is a private community of vetted innovators who help each other succeed. Check it out at theinnovators.community. This episode of Kill Innovations was produced by the Innovators Network. You can find the show notes and the entire show catalog going back to 2005 at killerinnovations.com. I'll talk to you next week, and in the meantime, go out and change the world with your killer innovation. Bye-bye.